regardless of our status uh, in academia, in business, the advice from Dr. Sherwin is remarkably applicable across the lifespan. So, yes, uh, when, you're, when you're being mentored, you discuss with your mentor uh, where you're going, what you're doing. But as you go on in life, you'll be talking to your friends, I hope, uh, and colleagues uh, about what, what else needs to be done in what you're doing. I, I've stayed in contact with my primary mentor from the NIH, and right now my company is developing a drug for him. Now, he, he's already 85 years old, and we've maintained that contact over the years of discussion uh, of, of critical points in development. I'm gonna take a very little of your time here and talk about one aspect uh, of, um, of science, uh, academia, and uh, private sector entrepreneurial uh, medicine. And this is translational medicine. Uh, when I looked at, the, original, looked at the, um, the design of this conference and saw the talks and saw who was talking, I, I found that 25% of the talks uh, on, in the first two days dealt with new developments that are entrepreneurial or and or it came out of business. If you look at the, the histories uh, of, uh, the, of our speakers here, you'll see a number of them are still in academia but may have started a business as well. And it is being attuned to what you are doing that is developable, developable, that may in fact uh, change the course of treatment of patients uh, that is really very important. In the U.S., uh, there is at every medical school an Office of Technology Transfer, which is responsible for uh, helping identify uh, intellectual property, copyrightable uh, materials and all. I would say that most of these offices uh, are not experienced enough uh, to do everything that is needed. They're worth contacting, however. But what I want you to do, in this from, uh, based on this brief talk, is to think about your own work in terms of translation. What is it that you're doing? Whether it is a new technique, whether it's a new product, whether it's a set of clinical observations uh, that need addressing. Think about this in terms of the impact that it can have if it's broadly broadcast to the right practice or institutional uh, environments. All right. The components of translation medicine, going from lab to bedside, or bed to bedside, as we say in the US, are the following. You have to have a discovery, and you have to protect it. Patenting is a huge operation in this country. You mentioned uh, uh, a, a trainee of yours who went, uh, went from the laboratory to law school. My primary colleague, Shaker Musa, at the, in, 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 in Albany, as a son who was an outstanding investigator. He's a patent lawyer right now, and he's terrific, and we're using him uh, for advice on certain things that we're doing. Even though he's a generation or two removed from us, he has developed enough experience in the legal profession to, in fact, be very helpful to us. So think about what you're doing. Is there a discovery in what you're doing that may be useful to society? If so, talk to your technology transfer experts or to patent lawyers about securing it. Then you need to obtain financial support, an enormous problem for all of us. You need to verify the discovery in widely accepted models. If in fact it's a, it's a, it's a system that can be uh, uh, identified only in obese rats, uh, you, may have, uh, you, you, may, you may have something of, of real interest scientifically, but it may not be translational medicine. You need to define the mechanism of action. In the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration uh, wants to know if you understand how your drug, how your product, how your device operates. If you don't understand that, then you have a problem in terms of predicting side effects. The toxicology is a problem, and the FDA uh, will lose sleep over your product. You need to do contract toxicology. Contract toxicology is using a commercial firm to, do the to, to measure the toxic effects of your drugs, a commercial firm that is accredited by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, and has no direct link to you, so that it is an unbiased assessment of your drug. Then you need to start talking with, in this country with the Food and Drug Administration, the European Union with its, with its counterpart, 
or in other countries with uh, their counterparts. And so you do investigative new drug application and approval. You do FDA phase one, early phase two trials. These are toxicology and early efficacy trials. And then you try to find somebody to really take this on in industry and uh, make it work as a device or product that uh, will be uh, useful uh, to society. So what's a discovery? It's a new drug, and new drug we need a composition of matter, how it's structured, what its structure is. It can also, we can also patent uses. Uses of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of existing drugs or new drugs are patentable but not very useful in terms of uh, inter interesting, uh, in terms of uh, trying to convince the, the pharmaceutical industry to develop them. Novel use of an existing drug is a discovery. Modification of an existing drug, for example, nanoparticulate formulations, and we've talked about that in several, several of the talks, a new test and a new device. These are all discoveries. All are, uh, may be the subjects of patent protection. Verification of the discovery and its utility in more than one system. Species-specific or cell or cell line-specific discoveries are very frequent. They're very interesting. As I said, they defeat translation. You can't take them to the bedside if they, in fact, are specific to an animal species. Uh, for example, it's, uh, in tumor biology, it's useful to consider the possibilities of mutation in commercial cell lines. We all trust some commercial cell lines, but in fact, mutations are occurring in some of those cell lines, and they may defeat us when we move into the clinic. It's also useful to consider use of primary cultures, orthotopic, subcutaneous versus subcutaneous uh, xenografts. The easiest thing for us in terms of xenograft studies in cancer is subcutaneous. Much more difficult to do orthotopic, and it takes specific training in order to do that. The definition of the mechanisms, the mechanisms involved in the discovery. While it's not essential, partial or complete definition of mechanisms is useful to the patenting process. Here, we're distinguishing the discovery from prior art. The FDA is cons very concerned about what has gone before. What, in fact, uh, is, uh, is in your product that may have been, in, been published elsewhere by, by, by others or may have been invented elsewhere and, and perhaps capitalized on in an entirely different area from where uh, you currently work. It's also essential to the reviews conducted by the Food and Drug Administration because possible sources of toxicity, as I said, can be recognized uh, when you uh, define mechanisms. Definition of mechanisms may suggest modifications of drugs or, modif or, or of devices for improved efficacy. Uh, so as you, as you realize uh, what the mechanism is, and uh, there are absolutely revelationary uh, assays that sometimes overnight uh, uh, tell you much more about your, your drug or device than you know, and it may be possible then to, uh, to redefine the mechanism and in fact to make the patent uh, more attractive and perhaps the drug or device safer uh, for patient care. And then you need to define mechanisms of drug. You, you, uh, you profit from defining mechanisms of drug actions because you, get, you may get new insights into pathogenesis of conditions. And uh, these, these insights may offer pathways to development of other pharmaceuticals or, or devices. In our own case, I've talked ad nauseum here about alpha V beta 3 integrin. Uh, the integrin has provided a, a host of inspirations to other, to, uh, other people we know, to collaborators and to competitors um, in terms of understanding how thyroid hormone acts, how resveratrol acts, how estrogen acts, and how androgen acts. Uh, so, understanding these, uh, uh, very important. Let me just give you one example. Resveratrol was sold uh, by an interesting company called Sertris in Cambridge, Massachusetts to GlaxoSmithKline for $750 million as an anti-aging, anti-lipid, uh, anti-diabetes, and anti-cancer drug. That's a nice load. In fact, when, they, when the, the initial cancer trials were, um, uh, were, were conducted, uh, we, uh, the company could not see the effect. And it became clear that, uh, that we didn't know enough about how resveratrol acted. Uh, the thinking was it got into the cell and was rapidly metabolized, and which metabolite was, uh, in fact, critical. So we didn't know enough about mechanisms. The world didn't know enough about mechanisms. Uh, in fact, we now know on alpha V beta 3, there's a resveratrol receptor that, in fact, is anti-cancer. 
I don't for a minute think that's the answer to hyperlipidemia uh, or to aging uh, or, to, or to diabetes, but we didn't know enough uh, about the drug at the time it was, it was taken taken up by a, a large pharmaceutical manufacturer. We didn't know enough uh, to make it useful clearly to the company to continue the development. The components of translation, this is the final slide, the components of translation are discovery and its isolation. Be aware, be aware of what you're doing and what its impact might be because you have the responsibility to, to uh, improve uh, the health of the people we're concerned about in, in biology, education, and, and, uh, and, and, um, and medical management. Secure financial, uh, uh, securing financial support is a huge problem, and this depends upon contacts you may have, uh, friends you may know, companies uh, that uh, may help you uh, find such, uh, 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 such support. Need to verify the discovery in widely accepted models, and you need to define mechanisms of action. So I will stop there. I just want you to think about in your daily lives uh, what you're doing, what you're grasping, grasping with, and is, is it in fact translatable into the clinic? And if so, start thinking about these particular steps. Comments or, or questions here? Yeah, yeah. You have virtually no leeway, so you have to think. You every time you write a paper, uh, if you're if you're looking at something that's tra that's uh, translational medicine, yeah. you have to say, uh, is there are there pieces of this that I in fact can't reveal at this particular time, and that takes consults, consultations with people who understand, with the individual, uh, Dr. Sherwan uh, 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 mentioned who've been in science and, and, can, and are now in law. Our best patent lawyer, PhD in chemistry, who went into law and is extraordinarily useful to us. We talk to him monthly about what we're doing. And he critiques, says, yes, you can publish this easily. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, our, do you have a device, do you have a drug here that uh, you, uh, you, you may want to postpone publication. Uh, and you can say, well, but isn't our, isn't our mission in science to educate, uh, to inform? Yes, it is. It's also a mission to help mankind. And the only way we can do that in large scale uh, efforts is with development of drugs and devices that are patentable. Otherwise, we won't find support for their, for their application. So you've raised a very important point, and offices of technology transfer need to be talking. We, a, a, a philanthropist I worked with and created a group that, that made itself available to medical schools across the US. And said, we, we said, let us come in and take a look at, the, at, at your various laboratories and their emphases, and, uh, and let us do some counseling. And we did that for, for a half dozen and you know, I think it was probably useful in terms of educating people. It's not easy, uh, and it's a conflict between science and 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 uh, release of information that everybody is interested in, and translation and protection that will enable treatments to proceed later when uh, you've got a decent patent that somebody can explain. You're, you're really at the heart of this. I think it was, uh, Dr. Schoen and I really enjoyed thinking about uh, what we might say, uh, say to you. And uh, as I said in the, in the case of Hubble's presentation, he really 
has said something to all of us, regardless of age in this particular room. Uh, I, what I have to say is very specific about uh, the transfer uh, of, of, of patentable information, and we need to be aware of it. Copyrightable information, we need to be aware. 